Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, everybody, to another chapter of Re Wonderland The Mask and the Maiden, written by A.S. Hunt, read by yours truly, Free Wado, with the exclamation point for the added emphasis. We did a little bit better this time. We are still just as sick. We're getting over being sick thereof. Uh, we almost died, though. Alice, you know, or Ashley, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, get my brain scrambled in the right places, you know. Uh, Ashley has been surviving quite a lot, and now I think she's making a mental change, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, but we know at least it's better for herself. Uh, she is not sitting around taking any more of that baloney as easily, at least. Um, we'll, see, we'll see how that works for her in Chapter 5. Follow, or half of my plan. It pleases me greatly to be able to put into publishing that I have, in just recent months, visited the Isles of Kalish, where hominids and mermaid work together to achieve a sustainable economy along the coasts. Not surprisingly, the desert area of the mainland is completely inhospitable to all. What with its treacherous canyons and caverns, and the horrific thought that the Zoe Labyrinth lies somewhere in it. That is to say nothing of the giant insectae that inhabit the lands, feeding off the beasts that roam, all just hunting each other so they can live and continue to hunt. But ah, this is a documentary for another time. The coasts more than make up for the existence of the continent, and it is a beautiful thing to behold Hom of the lands working with people of the sea. The mermaid are lovely people, despite having little resemblances to us. Hom proper, although there is a religion out there somewhere that claims we are cut from the same cloth, left to have dominion over our respective areas. But there is another that claims the mermaid are an evil species, indeed an illegitimate class of Dehom and the doomed seas are their prison for an unspeakable treachery caused back before anyone thought to document it physically. Yes, my weeks here were spent to very pleasantly. The alcoholic beverages that can only be made from undersea ferments are simply not of this world. The next thing I say, I say not for the faint of heart, but mermaid meat is especially wonderfully textured, and the flavor is delectable when smoked. It is an easy enough thing to do to travel to world land if one has a method of water travel and a healthy unfear of aquaticae and crustaceae, crustaceae. The little boggers are easy enough to rod for if one merely purchases and learns to use the appropriate tools, and everything in the West Sea is edible. Preparing and cooking is unfortunately another matter. Riverhorn require forged mallet to pierce the shell and Garland must be scaled wearing sunglass eyes to protect one from their harmful ultraviolet ultra shimmer. My personal favorite, already mentioned in my biography in the end, are of course the deepwater dodecapus, the drab purple bottom feeder with the crystalline shell. I've got a secret for removing the shell entirely, whilst the mainstream approach is to break them open. <coughs> my apologies. You can be sure the very bell I am pictured putting the use in the last Grand Cycle's Frostbreak edition of the Telltale Tortoisite is a modified but whole Dodecapus shell, and it rings more beautifully than any of my other wares. Buttered in the appropriate fats, this is a thing I can eat again and again, even stranded within the Drab King's halls in the south. Refusing their aquaticae eggs, that cost more by the plate than 50 copies of the teacup God's holy bound text, but I rambled, dear reader. As I mentioned, travel to the world and Len is not only possible, but enjoyable. Bring a map so as to avoid black spots that might be snarka, and take care after landing that you don't enter the wood. At least three known villages found some way to thrive on within that unnatural expanse of sinister forest. And at least one being, I won't say hum because no one is sure what the mat is, at least not yet, able to enter it and leave intact. I warn you again, read and enjoy my reports of its wonders, but stay away from the nameless wood. And if by chance this work has been translated and is being read by a mermaid, good for you. 
Stay away from the economy of Kalish. <coughs> oh. Apologies, readers, indeed. Oh. And thank, thank you, A.S. Hunt, for allowing me to read this sick. It just gives it all the, uh, <laughs> all the, uh, what is it, the culture that I could bring to an audiobook. Onto the actual story. In the evening, while the first sun had made most of its journey through the sky yet still had life, and the second sun had begun to peek over the hilltops and offer its eerie light, Fury made its arrival to the Vale. In all its muddy and dusty glory, the caravan proceeded through the grand entrance, a stone frame without doors, matching the wall that surrounded the eastern side of Lacey Vale, and a crowd quickly drew and grew to a mob to watch it enter. It had, of course, been here several times before. The Amphibia staff were noted for their pension of purchase of vast quantities of food and drink of all types, both for consuming and short-term short storage on the caravan, and also for their confident, if unsuccessful, attempts to court the less cultured ladies of the Vale. Here were Homs and Homa alike, a thousand or so, cheering and jeering the arrival of the caravan fury and its inhabitants, making way for its passage, which was marked by a wide stone path upon which it loudly tread. There were mixed views on the necessity of the trade brought in by the traveling freight company. On one hand, mer merchants enjoyed their patronage, which arguably helped the local economy by bringing in money. On the other, the Company of Fury was known to utilize their gargantuan beast of burden for deliveries of questionable legality. The crew of the caravan were a loud and tawny lot, branded as land pirates by many, loving to eat and drink and gamble and carouse past closing times and curfews, such as Paddock were. A few times to the point of one or more getting thrown in the town's gal overnight. The most supportive denizens were the owners and employees of the brewery, which was simply called the brewery, for their large outbound orders of their flagship product and traditional beverage of Lacey Vale, a filtered and distilled brew of fermented Edgar fruit, which was available in an assortment of brew strengths and flavorings. The crowds followed the caravan. Many kept their distance from the beast called Fury, most only half believing the tales of the necromancy that brought it movement before their eyes, while others who couldn't be bothered to leave their houses watched from afar with spyglasses, if their position was advantageous. Fury made its way to the east end of the town, where something of a station had been prepared for it. A building had been erected here after a sizable commission was paid by the mad so that the caravan would have a property to rest upon. Inasmuch as select townsfolk hated the idea, the station was only noticeably larger than the length, width, and height of Fury, walls made from felled veil oak, and roof made from rolled and riveted sheets of metal which jutted out to just cover it from the elements. Of doors, there was a large one in front and in back, both of which rolled upward along tracks to let the beast machine in and out and keep out unwelcome intruders when the crew was absent. A smaller building was attached two-thirds past the entrance, closer to where the head would be, and only the only other door was hung here, larger than any used by any hom. Presumably used to load or unload materials in bulk. Obscenities and maledictions wrote in various substances coated the windowless walls of it all, as well as the attached smaller building, into which the engineator went to prepare for refueling. Only the engineator understood what this was, and only he was involved in the process, which was quite fine with the rest of the crew. It was indeed consensus um, even amongst the vagabond paddock but the less one knew about the operation of Fury, the better. The navigateer took to disappearing entirely at this point and would not be seen until it was time to depart again. This was normal. The paddock went on without nod or word on their two guests. The Baroness and Ashley had disembarked at the exit of the building when Fury finally stopped. The girl following the woman. It felt meet to walk behind her as the woman mentioned to follow. Though the lighting was insufficient for her to see very much of the interior of the station, 
and she was equal parts disappointed and relieved when they were outside. The citizens here were still jeering and whistling. They made way for the travelers, but there were many leers and blank stares from the Hom populace in general. Ashley did not mind so much being transfixed on their state and overall manner, noting their appearance and dress as being different than any in her experience, which of course was pitifully limited in the first place. Hominids, it seemed, were like her in almost every way. Her skin was much paler where theirs had more tone from person to person, excepting some who were sickly, but their skin took on a green pallor that her own porcelain skin didn't have. Their clothes were unlike Ethan and Nalori's. The style seemed to be single colors pieced together, dressed for cool or foggy weather. Some people wore pieces on their heads, wraps as well as covers that went over their faces. Many of them were dirty. The Baroness ignored everyone entirely. Homos were far more beautiful to Ashley than their home counterparts. Part home, part animale, somehow, yet nothing like Dina. Unfamiliar at the same. Lacey Vale was separated somewhat haphazardly into off kilter grids of buildings, with each row and column, curvy as they were, signed a number of signs indicating the names of the roads. Ashley was pleasantly surprised to find many of these were numbered and thus readable. The girl followed the Baroness onto one such street, which winded so that she could not see the end of it beyond the lining of the businesses and houses on either side. And the two of them walked for some minutes, followed by a small crowd that continued the lewd and rude gestures and comments that had begun in the square. It reduced to no one at all in short time, however, and Ashley was quite contented for it. Despite the cause being a shift in the surroundings, the yards in the front of the houses ahead were gated, and the gates grew taller as they walked on, and thicker and there were a manner of beasts in the front providing additional protection should robbery occur. This neighborhood was dangerous. She had decided, too, that no one wanted to follow the woman too far down a road when they may not be able to run for their safety should she turn to discipline them. The woman was like steel, however. She had never indicated that she even noticed. Where are we going? asked the girl, taking note of the wild differences between the buildings. They differed in height, width, and in color, and their shape and architecture seemed mismatched to one another. From time to time, she saw someone poking their head through the door at them, or peering through curtains or from behind a tree, but they disappeared as soon as they noticed her noticing them. There is a debt to be collected, replied the Baroness, and I am to collect. A debt, ma'am? The mad does business with unusual types. In a place like the Vale, a narrow-minded shithole, it may be the only way to do it at all. When you deal in the things that mad deals in. And what does the mad deal in? Keep your mouth shut and your ears open, girl, and you undoubtedly observe for yourself before we leave. Ashley asked no more questions for the duration of their walk, and when they finally arrived at their destination, the girl noticed a fog had penetrated their surroundings, leaving visible the road behind them and the eerie, flat manor in front. A gate went around it, half Ashley's height, and the Baroness had to stoop to push the squatty door open for them to step through. There was a smooth surface going to the front door. The Baroness slowed her pace, placing her hand on her hilt. Ashley knew nothing of defensive stances. She could only follow suit by hugging herself as they advanced. Four Vesper pups came running at them from all directions. Ashley yelped, but the woman did not even place her hand on her rapier. Chains were heard under the barking, and the four were stopped dead in their tracks before the narrow path the two were on. There were restraints keeping them in check. The woman went forward briskly now, and Ashley was sure she had heard her chuckle. The girl looked at each of the yelping pups, yelping pups before following her. She was disappointed. She had hoped they would be cute in their youth, but they were short and squat, and slobbered about probably more than the adults she had seen, if that was possible. They reached the front door, and a woman knocked five times lightly. There was a full minute wait, then the door cracked open. 
An old and unassuming character stood in the gap, white of hair and tall in gesture and stature. He bowed deeply to the woman and gestured for her to come in. The girl followed her into the flattish manner where they sat uncomfortably, where they sat comfortably on odd plush furniture that bounced under their weight. Ashley thought this capital, jumping in her seat a little until an, another tall older gentleman summoned them. They followed him down a hall and through a door into an office of some probably intermediate size. A very fat hom sat behind a desk on a shay that apparently had wheels installed so as to give them the freedom of so mobility. He was in the process of turning the grand thing to greet them as they entered. He took hold of his shirtless mass and piled what he could on the desk in front of him. Good day, lasses, he said, his voice deep and wide as it was patronizing. One can't help but use what's available for support, you know. Baroness, it's such a pleasure as usual. And who is this young lady? The, uh, the woman narrowed her eyes at him. You have an outstanding balance with the MAD, which has accrued an interest rate of 6.6%, .6%, she said in a low tone. Compounded over 18 days past the due date, you are expected to pay all or a greater part today. The massive hom stared blankly at her, glancing at Ashley. Of course, my beautiful. You always were so fabulous at negotiations. It's such a shame you won't put yourself on the market. You know, expand your horizons. Put some of these skills you possess to more lucrative purposes. The woman sat steely-eyed, watching as the fat one pulled out a long tube from his desk drawer. Some habits. They die hard, don't they, leopard? She said. Oh, some habits, they die hard, don't they, Leopard? she said. Leopard drew a cup from nowhere and proceeded to fill it with a substance from the tube. It looked like smoke, but poured like water. Twenty, said the woman. If Mr. Leopard can pay his debt in full, he will be your new master. You will be offered an incentive, as incentive. Ashley gasped. She had no love for the idea of being passed around like a prize. Of course, he should also know that defaulting on his debt will send a trigger. Another agent of the mad will come, someone with quite different intentions. Ah, the lie, or Moradus, perhaps, exclaimed Lepid, drinking from the cup. They working for that one still? Gratifyingly, said the woman. Are you sure about that, said Lepid. Allowing a grin to creep up past his nose, revealing crooked teeth and green gums. I bet they don't even get paid. Some of us aren't in it for the money, Leopard. Ah, true. Benefits, then? Protection, perhaps. Insurance, seethed the Leopard, sounding as if he needed to swallow. Funny thing, insurance. The rates are always changing. Premiums, they go up. Deductibles, they go up. Then your bill is up either way. Ashley feared speaking out of turn at this moment, while she was outraged at having been brought just to satisfy a debt. She was sure this was a great matter of import spoken between two highly dangerous individuals. Moreover, she found Leopard disgusting, not wishing to be anywhere near him, and her senses were failing at breathing. And now evident stench of his unwashed body. The Baroness simply eyed him coldly. She was not fond of small talk. It was obvious to all in the room, including the sword-clad fellows that had just entered and were standing by the exit, that she was not fond of Leopard either. How will you plan on paying today? She asked curtly. Leopard continued ignoring her. It's not a monopoly anymore, he said, rolling his eyes and gesturing dramatically with the back of his hand to his forehead. No one can get what the mad wants but me. But no one can offer what the mad offers but the mad. When did he become so important, anyway? Baroness had not moved an inch. She acted like she hadn't even heard him. Full payment? She said. Ashley's thoughts turned to begging. No, please don't pay in full. I've always given my hundred and ten percent, my dear, said Leopard. It was a cold war. One hundred and ten, and now I have something to show for it. You know, my dear, 
I have an associate who recently traveled to Memerg. The Baroness's eyes widened just in the slightest. Mm-hmm. Your old stomping grounds, if I am not mistaken. The fat thing continued. Jowls about. But I think this is here. I think this here is where I'm going to have to end the part, y'all. We uh we do have, don't we don't have a break for quite a while more quite a while more so I think we'll go with what we are at then there's a few more in the next part there will be a few more pages into a break and then finally the finishing of chapter four so I think this was a very good place to stop for the first part stop in the middle of negotiations with this new leopard fella hopefully I remember his voice because I again I am sick and thank you so much for all like just being. You know, you got to deal with it anyway if you're going to listen to this, so whatever. <laughs> Y'all, make sure to stay beautiful, stay hydrated, and we'll see you in the next part.